All right, all right, all right. We're back here in the Rock Cave for you and Song of the Day. How's everybody Saturday? So far, it's pretty early, right? So, anyway, love our Saturdays. What are we doing today, people? It's been a big week as far as birthdays are concerned here at Song of the Day. Uh, I mean, Glenn Danzig, 65. Wow. Cindy Lauper, that was a good one. We got another 65 year old this week, uh, yesterday actually, and that's what we're doing today. Uh, Mick Jones turned 65 yesterday. Not to be confused with Mick Jones of Foreigner, right? Mick Jones of The Clash, founding member of The Clash. I have a Clash poster here, don't I? Yep, it's right there. Uh, I couldn't find my Clash t shirt. There is one floating around here somewhere, I think. I think it's in my overflow area, which maybe Sarah doesn't know about, but uh, it would require me to wake up one of my children if I needed to get to that area. So, uh, so I just decided to go and take the high road there. Anyway, Mick Jones, founding member of The Clash, born in London. Seems like they all went to art school. Uh, the schooling system in, uh, in the UK is interesting, but they always end up, a lot of these artists end up going to art school. And, but he says from a young age he wanted to be a musician. He just knew that. And as a teenager, he was already following bands around and sleeping in trains and sneaking into shows. And he followed uh, Mott the Hoople around, and that was just his thing. He did uh, form a band, and that band was called London SS. Uh, and that was with Paul Cinnamon and Keith Levine, who would kind of be, who would end up being in The Clash. Um, and at age 21, he met Joe Strummer, and that's when the band kind of broke up and they, they formed uh, The Clash. Um, interestingly enough, Keith Levine, pretty early on, was not happy with his role in The Clash. And so at one point, you got to understand that at this point in the, the mid to late 70s in, in London, this underground punk scene was dominated by the Sex Pistols and Basically, the Sex Pistols were the gold standard for that kind of music. But all these bands were kind of friends and rivals, as they were. They, it was kind of an interesting story, but they were, they were definitely friends. But there was only so many of them, and they definitely had a rivalry going. And The Clash were, were aware that they wanted to aspire to be like the Sex Pistols. And, uh, and other bands around were like The Damned, and they were coming up as well. So they were kind of trying to figure that all out. All out. And there were personnel changes and people coming in and out of bands and and if you and they you would open up for the Sex Pistols that would be a big deal but it seems like they all pretty early on the Clash was opening up for the Sex Pistols even when they were bad I mean one of their early shows the review was their garage rock should stay in the garage rock with the motor running I mean that's pretty bad right but that that made them practice more and they basically shut themselves up into a, a into a warehouse for a month practicing but I, I digress so uh, the side story on Keith Levine is that he approached at a Sex Pistols show. He approached Johnny Rotten, Johnny Lydon, same guy, and said, "Hey, if you guys ever break up, we should form a band." And so, what happened in '78 ish or so? That's exactly what happened. He gets kicked out of the Clash. The Sex Pistols break up, and they form Public Image Limited Pill. Some of you may know that band. Some of you know that band, you know some of their songs, because if you listen to First Wave, you know their songs, but you just don't know you're listening to them because they had um, basically, for a brief time, they had some hits. Um, Seattle, um, Rise, that's played on uh, First Wave now. Uh, this is not a love song, probably the most famous one. That was on MTV's 120 Minutes, still played on First Wave. Uh, and Home, that's another song. But anyway, that's exactly what happened with that. So that's one side thing there. Um, so, The Clash. They're formed uh, in 77 or so, uh, basically. And uh, they do pretty early on. Like I said, they open up for uh, the Sex Pistols. They work on their craft, and uh, because of the scene that's going on there, they actually end up getting signed to CBS record for an unheard of $100,000 uh, in advance contract. I mean, this was unheard of then. They put out their debut album um, in 78, 
Uh, there are sing that went to number 12. The song White uh, Riot went to number 34. Uh, again, 78, Clash City Rockers. Uh, White Man in Hammersmith Palace. I mean, everyone knows Clash songs, right? We all know what happened with the Clash. They became really huge pretty fast. The second album, they brought in an American producer to mixed reviews. I mean, generally good reviews, but uh, that was Give Him Enough Rope. And that had Tommy Gunn, which charted. And uh, one of my favorite songs that I didn't learn about till much later was Julie's Been Working for the Drug Squad. And I think the first time I heard that song was in um, that John Cusack movie where he's the plays the hitman. Uh, what, what movie is that? I'll come up with it. But anyway, then 1979 comes along and they put out London Calling that would change everything. London Calling double album. That pretty much is called one of the best, greatest albums of all time. Uh, that's where that poster is from in back of me right there. Uh, that had, I mean, it's like a greatest hits, right? London Calling, a brand new Cadillac, Rudy Can't Fail, another song that I didn't know about till later. It's really the the reggae ska clash songs that I learned about later that I really like. Uh, Spanish Bombs, of course. Clamp Down, which you never really understood what he was saying in those lyrics, right? Um, the Guns of Brighton, Train in Vain. Everyone knows Train in Vain. Another one that you don't know that that's the song. You know, it's kind of like Bob O'Reilly, right? Train in Vain. Uh, Train in Vain was thrown in at the last minute on that record. So the the initial pressings of that record didn't even have that listed as a track. They had to put a sticker on there uh, in the first pressings, and then it became a hit, so they obviously listed it afterwards. But at first, you did not know that that song was on there. Uh, that's when they kind of explode. They're kind of the ambassadors of this, this punk rock. Um, they put out a couple of singles in 81. These are also late songs for me to, to love, but they're um, among my favorites. Uh, this is Radio Clash in 81 and The Magnificent Seven. These are just great Clash songs. They're probably my favorite Clash songs, those two right there when we're up there. Um, it's, you know, it's actually kind of hard to pick, isn't it? I mean, London Calling, that's, that's good stuff. Anyway, 82, by the time 82 comes out, they put out uh, Combat Rock. That's when I get introduced to The Clash because I have MTV in 82, right? And it's a big deal. But they're already falling apart. They're already not getting along. That was terrible recording sessions. They were not getting along well at all. And that's basically when uh, things went to hell. Uh, songs from that album. I played that cassette all the time, especially the first side. Uh, know Your Rights, Should I Stay or Should I Go. Rock the Casbah, which has been played to death. Great song, but it's hard to listen to now because we've heard it so many times. And my favorite song on that album or at least one of them, is Straight to Hell. If you don't know that song, Straight to Hell, you got to give that one a listen. I like that song a lot. Uh, so the band implodes. They break up. This is where it gets interesting. Uh, Mick Jones is starting to put together a band, but then he's also chatting with his friend Dave Wakeling and Ranking Roger. Remember when they came up? These are the guys who came from the English beat, the beat. They went on to form a band. And when they are discussing forming this band, Mick Jones is in the conversation and they decide to form this band. And this band is general public. We talked about general public, right? Most people don't know that Mick Jones was briefly in general public and was a founding member. There's actually a one picture of them playing together. So they recorded an album. And he left in the middle of the recording of that album. But if we all remember that we mentioned that song, we all know the song by General Public, Tenderness. And that was uh, a hit. And he's playing guitar on that song. Little known fact. Uh, he ends up leaving mid midway, and those guys stick together. The early members of General Public include also people, members from the specials and from Dexy's Midnight Runners. So what was the project he was working on when he was doing that as well? Well, it was his band, Big Audio Dynamite. We all know Big Audio Dynamite, right? So they put out their first few records, but their first one, the very first one in 85, has hits that you'll hear now. Medicine Show, The Bottom Line, E equals MC Squared, and Bad. I think the song Bad is played in Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Anyway, it's this themes, it's like spaghetti western themes. There's all these quotes from Clint Eastwood songs and stuff throughout that album. Love that album. Lineup changes, they, had, they put out a bunch of albums under that name, but then lineup changes and he renames the band Big Audio Dynamite 2. That's where I and probably we all hear about them for the first time. 
Bad 2 comes out in 91, and that was all over the place. Everyone, The Globe, Rush, those are the two ones that everyone remembers. Uh, I remember playing a lot of those songs off that record. Uh, Can't Wait, I Don't Know. Um, anyway, that's a great record. And then they put out some other stuff. It, it, it kind of mixes up the lineups and all that stuff. But uh, if, if you don't haven't played Big Audio Dynamite 2 recently, give it a shot. I'm going to post some of that stuff underneath. Another side note, when the, all that later on, when people are doing their own thing, Joe Strummer of The Clash, he has a song in that movie. Who saw the movie Mr. and Mrs. Smith, right? That big scene in the end where they're back-to-back -back shooting everyone and uh, get, defending themselves. There's a song playing in the background, um, and that is Joe Strummer and the Mescarellos, and it's called Mondo Bongo. Love that song. Anyway, I already did, what, 11, again, 11 minutes. Damn, I cannot stop, right? I can't make them short. I can't do five minutes. I can't do seven. It's always right around 11. So thanks for sticking with me. Mick Jones, 65 years old of The Clash, our song of the day. Well, we're going to do what we usually do, which is to put a bunch of songs on there. But if you said, Mark, what is your favorite Clash song? <sighs> it's tough. Uh, I would have to say we'd probably have to go with... Uh, this is Radio Clash, or The Magnificent Seven. It's between those two. I'd say The Magnificent Seven probably edges them out. And we're going to put some big audio dynamite on there, too, for you guys to listen to. Tell me about your favorite Clash song. Let me know what you think. Have a great Saturday, as usual. And we'll see you on the flip side.